At Tri-State Worship Center, our aim isn't to be the best church in the community, but to be the best church for the community. We're here to encourage the saints, help the hurting, and embrace all people. At Tri-State Worship Center, there's a ministry for everyone. So if you're looking for a place to grow and serve others, or just need some additional encouragement, we've got you covered. casual and very friendly. You'll barely make it through the door without being greeted with a smile and a handshake or even a hug. about a dress code. We don't have one. The important thing is that you come. So come in what you have and we'll go from there. It's our vision to be a beacon, a light, a celebration of hope, a hope that we can only find in Jesus. We only ask one thing. You've tried it your way. Why not give his way a try? We'll see you at church. Hey, good morning. morning. Welcome to Tri-State Worship Center. We're here to encourage the saint, help the hurting, embrace all people. Those of you joining us on Facebook, we appreciate you joining us. Those that are here in the sanctuary, we are excited that you're here. Uh, We're just looking forward to what the Lord has in store. This is my lovely wife, Vicki, my first wife, Vicki, of 43 plus years. And uh, aren't you, are are you glad that they're here too? I am. You are? You are? Okay. Okay. So if you're in this... I'm cutting him off. <laughs> if you are in-house and a first-time guest, you should have received a card, and it looks like this. And if you will text the word welcome to the number on the screen, we would appreciate it. Um, we also have a, a digital gift card for you. And if you're a regular tender, type, uh, text the word here to the same number. Good morning, Facebook. Welcome. So excited to have you. Send us some highs, some messages, some great to be here. Um, You know, hearts, where you're from. Just uh, let's connect on Facebook. So I want to I want to do it like those people that do live where they're like, hey, Sherry, so glad you're joined. And then they keep talking. Hey, Joey, good. No, we don't do that. Uh, We're not going to stop the service here in a little bit and take up an offering. We don't receive it that way. We ask you to drop your tithe, your offering, your building fund commitments, your missions giving into these boxes that are on the wall located throughout the building. Or you can text to give at 740-370-4342. You can go to our website, uh, tswc.org. You can give there. Or if you're watching us by Facebook, you can hit shop now and it'll take you to our giving page. Uh, or you can swipe your card at the kiosk that's out in the foyer. However you do it, we need you to do it so that we can keep doing what we do, which is spreading the good news of Jesus Christ. Can I get amen? Amen. 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 Sorry, dry throat today. Um, so thank you to everyone that helped out with Marketplace. Um, 
that's a big undertaking, and I don't see Karen Partridge here, but huge thank you. She out somewhere. She probably is. Huge thank you to her for organizing the marketplace yesterday. It was a great day. Also out there on the table, you probably noticed that there's some leftover Ranger popcorn, and you can take a bag uh, for free, or if you'd like to leave a donation, that would be awesome also. Trunk or Treat, this Saturday, October the 30th, 5 o'clock. Uh, we're starting at Food Fair, and we still need some more people to trunk or treat with us. If you don't want to take the time to decorate your vehicle, um, just bring a chair and some candy. And just hang out with us, and let's just um, bless the South Point community. We're starting with hot dogs at 5 uh, at Food Fair, and at 6 is the regular community trunk or treat, or trick or treat in South Point. Amen. Uh, November the 6th, which is a week from this Saturday... From 7 to 11, right here at the church, we are going to be having a uh, pancake breakfast to uh, help raise funds for the Avad ministry. Avad is, yeah, yep, yeah. uh, worship through service. Now, I know that Dale's, the back of Dell's shirt says a lot more than that. I just abbreviated it. But it's basically home missions. We're here to try to, or Avad ministry is trying to minister to this community. And uh, so we, we want to help resource them by having this fundraiser. Seven dollars a piece. You can eat all the pancakes you can. That's on November the 6th from 7 to 11. Those funds will help uh, fund the Come to the Table event that they're going to have at Thanksgiving time at Lawrence Commons, correct? We're thinking about Lawrence Commons and the Country Hearth, and the Country Hearth uh, Hotel. So we, uh, we're going to, Dell and Avad Ministries are going to try to uh, do it at both places. So if you can come that Saturday, that'd be great. We're going to put our prayer list up on the screens. There's just so many names that so, have so many needs. And then I got a couple more that just got called in just this morning. One just a few minutes ago. Uh, Robert Allen is Angie Augusto's dad. He was taken to the hospital yesterday. They admitted him, and he will have a heart cath this afternoon. Richard Booth, uh, who has attended our church on several occasions, passed away this morning. So we want to remember the Richard Booth family. And then Jerry Wagner, my brother, who is not on the platform with us, he is uh, really struggling with some back issues. And uh, he, he actually texted me, which he doesn't, he doesn't normally ask for this. But he said, please, please, please have him pray for me. So let's remember Jerry. Let's stand. If you have a special need this morning, can I just see your hand real quick? Anybody believe God is able? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for today. This is the day that you've made for us. Let us right now, in this moment, make the choice to rejoice and be glad in it. I pray this morning that as we do that, as we lift you up, as we magnify your name, that you come and inhabit your, the praises of your people. I pray that while you're here, you just supply every need. Those that are represented on our prayer list, those represented by an uplifted hand, those represented by the people that are watching us on Facebook, that you would just supply every need according to your riches and glory through Christ. I pray, God, we could hear some reports of victory, some testimonies of how you've touched your people. God, we pray this morning you'll bless those who give in the offering and multiply that offering for the upbuilding of your kingdom. Lord, let everything that we do this morning, every word that we speak, every song that we sing, every action that we take, point somebody to Jesus Christ. We love you, we praise you, and we thank you for that, for it is in Christ's name that we pray. Someone shout amen. amen. Turn around and wave at somebody. Tell them you're glad to see them in church. Just let me remind you of a couple things real quick. Tonight at 6 o'clock is our men's Bible study. We're going to be... Uh, continuing on in James chapter 3. Yeah. At least somebody's glad. Uh, you don't want to miss that, man. It's just been incredible. It grows every week. And I think the Lord is doing some incredible stuff in the lives of our men around the church here. Also, we still need some help in our Christian education department. That's our uh, what we call our CE department, the discipling arm of our church. Whether you can teach or whether you can just help in a classroom, we need you uh, we, we have a policy here at Tri-State Worship Center where we try to have two adults in every classroom, and uh, we need somebody to watch out for Dave Ashworth, and we just don't have anybody to sit in there with him. So uh, if you can help out, see Jake Bolts. Jake Bolts, she would love to talk to you about helping us in our CE department. And then a uh, shameless plug for our podcast, just saying, we will record uh, episode 7 tomorrow, which we call our lightning round, which is really open to any questions that anybody might have. So if you have a question, send it to me, text it to me, uh, send it to T-W-A-G-N-R-N-E-R-T-Wagner977 at gmail.com, and uh, we're going to record episode 7 of season 4 
It's crazy that it uh, seems like uh, just yesterday we started that. So if you get a chance to catch up on it, it's on our website as well as the four platforms that we, uh, we release it onto. And then finally, don't forget that Avad pancake breakfast. Really want you to come and help us with that. Last thing, last thing. At the end of this service, I told uh, one of the vendors that were here yesterday at the marketplace, I said one of the great things about having a multi-purpose room is that you can have a lot of different functions in this room. The bad thing about having a multi-purpose room is that you can have a lot of functions in this room. Uh, we had this completely cleaned out of chairs yesterday, and it was all set up as a marketplace. And then we came in last night and set them all up. And this Wednesday at 6 o'clock is our shoebox packing party, which means all the chairs have to come back down again. So if you would do this for me, listen very carefully to these instructions. And those of you that have been around a while, you know me. I'm a chair Nazi. I get it. But listen very carefully. Stack the chairs at the end of this service. If you would just stack the chairs three high, just three high, and drag them either to the front or to the back. What we need to do is open up that center section so that we can set up tables to pack our shoe boxes. Only three high. Listen to me. If you stack them four high, you're going to put railroad tracks in our carpet. Don't stack them four high. Three high. Three. Ben, you got it? Three. 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 Yeah. Ben goes, three. Okay, that's fine. You can do, that's fine. <laughs> three. Now, if I see someone doing four, I'm going to punch you in the throat. <laughs> Tell God I found you that way. All right? Three high and either pull them up toward the front or push them to the back. If you would do that, that'll help us. And that way, uh, Wednesday night, we can have our packing party. Everybody that understands that say, uh-huh. Okay, someone please explain it to Ben uh, Box. Unqualified, week nine, week nine. We've been at this thing a while. I'm hoping that it's making a difference in somebody's life. I don't think the Lord would have us camp out here this long if it wasn't helping somebody. Been using Colossians chapter one, verse 12. Colossians chapter one, verse 12 is our uh, leaping off verse, which is give thanks to the Father who qualifies us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. That inheritance is eternal life with God. So look at me. It's God that qualifies us to spend eternity with him. It's not anybody else. It's not anything else. It's God. Then 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. Not that we're sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency, sufficiency is from God. God created us. God made us. We are fearfully and wonderfully made, and it's He who gives us our sufficiency. We've kind of been using as our mantra, if you will, that what matters most is not what comes to your mind when you think about Terry Wagner. What matters most is what, does, what comes to God's mind when He hears my name and when He hears your name. And so if you've missed any of these, I'd encourage you to go to the YouTube channel, Tri-State Worship Center. It's on YouTube. Go to the playlist of videos, and you'll see all the other messages up to this one listed there. Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you for your awesomeness. We thank you that you're a God in heaven that loves us and cares about us. We thank you that we're able to come together for such a time as this, just to praise you and worship you in spirit and in truth. But now, Lord God, we, we need to hear your voice. We need to be able to distinguish your voice from all the other voices and all the other noise that goes on in life. I pray, God, that somehow, some way today, we would discover the real us so that you, Lord God, can bless the real us. So help us today. I pray that in Christ's name, someone say amen. amen. I want to talk a little bit about this battle that goes on within us. There's a battle that goes on within us. I don't know if you've ever thought about how much of our lives and how much of our resources and how much of our, our energy revolves around the simple fact that we try to put forth a certain appearance, a certain image, a certain reputation, a certain recognition of who we are. We spend a lot of time, a lot of resources trying to get people to think that we're something that we're not. I didn't expect to be, amen. We launch these daily PR campaigns because somehow, someway, we think that what we have is incompetence and insufficient. And somehow, someway, to prove that we're competent and to prove that we have value, we're going to launch this PR campaign to convince everybody that we're all that and a bag of chips. We are all too familiar with our shortcomings and with our weaknesses 
We're all too familiar with what we have as warts and wrinkles. And what we conclude, what you conclude, and what I conclude is that to get ahead in life requires me to become someone else. If I'm going to get another rung on the ladder of success, I can't just be me because I have weaknesses, I have shortcomings, I have warts, I have wrinkles, so I have to become someone else. As a matter of fact, the old saying is we learn to fake it until we can make it. But in the Christian community, I think we fake it until it breaks us. Until it breaks us. And so I want to look at the master pretender in the Old Testament, the master pretender. And as we look at this guy, I want to answer two questions. What did it get him? Where did it land him? What did it get him? Where did it land him? His name is Jacob. His name is Jacob, and he had identity issues from the moment he was born. As a matter of fact, the name Jacob literally means heel grabber. Heel grabber. Not mountain-like, but back of your foot type heel grabber. Everybody with me? He was a twin. His twin brother was Esau. So you have Jacob and Esau, but they were ridiculously competitive as twins, even in the womb. The Bible tells us that they wrestled even in the womb. Now, a side note to that would be, that sounds to me like there's two uh, babies in that womb that were viable before they were born, contrary to what some may say. And when they were born, Esau came out first and Jacob came out holding his heel. Are you listening? Hence the name, Jacob, the heel grabber. Nowadays, that would have been like a good story. But back in Jacob's day, this was a very important thing because the order of birth was everything. Oldest son was going to get more of the inheritance. Older son was going to get more of the blessing. And and as the firstborn son, Esau would have had these unique privileges These unique blessings. He received a double portion of the inheritance. It refers to the transfer of that authority and that leadership, if you will. Jacob never got over the fact of losing out because he didn't win the race in the birth canal. Jacob never got over the fact that he was not going to be firstborn. And he spent the next several decades trying to plot to get what Esau was going to have. You have to listen very carefully to that. In the sanctuary on Facebook, Jacob spends the next several decades plotting to get something that someone else had that he thought he should have had. We buy things we don't need with money we don't have to impress people we don't like. I'll stay over here. So... His third word was Jacob. I am Jacob. He didn't like what it meant. Every time someone said his name, it meant you weren't born first. It meant you were grabbing someone's heel on the way out. He wanted to be Esau. He wanted to have what Esau was going to get. Are you listening? But he was Jacob. He seemed to be this guy that was just going to be second best his whole life. The Bible says that despite them being twins, they were polar opposites of each other. Esau, when he was born, looked like a baby Chewbacca. He was full of hair. He was probably one of the original stars on Duck Dynasty. He was a hunter. He was an outdoorsman. Where Jacob was born, smooth-skinned, mama's boy. Jacob probably spent more time watching HGTV than he did ESPN. Are you catching what's going on here? And on top of the differences between the twins, the parents played favorites. The parents played favorites. Isaac loved Esau, while Rebekah loved Jacob. Now listen, Jacob grew up in the shadow of his brother. Jacob grew up probably thinking, if I had just been born a few minutes earlier, just a few minutes earlier, I would have the security and the blessing that Esau's going to get. It would all be mine. 
And interestingly enough, Jacob doesn't just mean hill grabber. When he says, I am Jacob, it also means I'm a deceiver. I'm a surplanter. I'm a usurper, which is a person who grabs authority that's not theirs in order to take what Esau had. And Jacob wants Esau's position so badly that he tricks him into giving it to him. He tricks Esau with a bowl of soup. We'll talk about that later. But for now, let's just look at the bigger trick that's being played on Isaac, the father. Isaac's dying. He's blind. He can't see well. He can't hear very well. And so he calls Esau so that he can give Esau the blessing. Is everybody with me so far? Esau, Jacob are twins. Esau's born first. He's going to get the blessing. He's going to get double inheritance. Isaac, the father, is about to die. He calls Esau in. He says, I'm about to die. Would you do me a favor? Go out and kill something so that I can eat. When Rebecca hears this, she begins to plot. She calls Jacob into the room and said, listen, I just overheard your dad Tell your brother to go get him some food because he's going to bless him. So here's what we've got to do. This is your chance. You go into Esau's closet. You get his best clothes and put it on. I'll get some animal skins and put it on your arms and around your neck in case your dad reaches out to touch you. Or he can smell the outdoors on the clothes and on the animal skin. I'll dress you up and he'll think you're Esau. Trust me. He's blind as a bat. He can't see anything. This is going to work. Are you listening this morning? <laughs> now, now, another time we can discuss the reason why these boys were so polar opposites. Because their parents played favorites. I know we don't want to talk about this morning. There's no wonder that these twins were dysfunctional. Because Isaac loved Esau and Rebecca loved Jacob. I wonder how many third words of life are in place early in life. You'll never be the athlete your brother was. You'll never be as smart as your sister was. You're never going to... And then that child grows up thinking, why am I pretending to be something that I'm not? To try to make my parents happy? Why am I trying to be someone else? Who told me that I'm supposed to be and so there's no wonder this dysfunction happens between Jacob and Esau because their parents caused it. We need some parents to be parents. Well, I just want to be friends. No, they got friends. They need parents. I don't understand what's going on with my kids. Sometimes you need to whoop them. Oh, sorry. No, we don't do that anymore. Forget it. Never mind. I got so many, so many things I want to say right now. But if you're a parent... You have an awesome responsibility. God has trusted you, trusted you, given you the responsibility to raise your children, not just to raise them, but to raise them to realize who they are, not who we want them to be, not who we think they should be. We don't do that by force. We don't do that by control. We don't do that by turning them into many me's. We, we teach them that by teaching them to value who they are. I have a grandson that's 12, 12 years old. He went to the doctor for his annual checkup this week. He is six foot three and weighs 250 pounds. Those of you that remember Jonas from two years ago, he was not that big. Suddenly he is big. And guess what grandpa wants him to do? Be the best offensive tackle this world has ever seen. Guess what? Jonas could care less about sports. He loves music and he loves the books. And I want him to value who he is, not who I want him to be. I ain't got time to talk about all of that. That's kind of a side note, a rabbit trail, if you will. But how many children have started out having to pretend to make a parent happy? Never mind. Back to our story. Rebecca told Jacob her big scheme. Jacob wasn't so sure about it, but he went along with it. Jacob went along with it because he really wanted what Esau has. Now, before we start blaming Rebekah and before we start feeling sorry for Jacob, 
Let's remember one important fact, and that is at this moment in time, Jacob is 76 years old. All right? It, it, listen, it, it's time that a 76-year-old quit blaming mommy for everything. As a matter of fact, it's time for some 20-year-olds to quit blaming mommy for everything. You've got to own it, right? They may not have done it right in the beginning, but you've got to own it. And Genesis 27 tells us the story of, at first, how Isaac was very suspicious about what's going on. He's dying. He's saying Esau out. Jacob gets Esau's clothes, puts it on with the skins. He goes in. And at first, Isaac thought he recognized Jacob's voice. But when he felt the hairy skin and he smelled the aroma of the field, suddenly he's convinced. Suddenly he's convinced that the pretense had worked. Isaac blessed Jacob. About that time, Esau shows up. He's not just mad. He's murderous. He's breathing fire. And everybody there knows that he was serious. Everybody there knows that he knows how to handle weapons. And they got nervous. Which left only one option for Jacob. Run, Jacob, run. And that's what he did. Jacob got the blessing. Listen to what I'm saying. Jacob got the blessing and then spent the next 21 years of his life running. He got a blessing and then he becomes a fugitive. He gets the blessing, but it's not what he thought it was going to be. Oh man, who am I talking to right now? You ran for it. You lied about it. You pretended you got it. You're like, this ain't what I thought it was going to be. Now listen, if you're married, it's too late. You just got to work that out. Some blessing that is, but that's what happens. Listen to me. That's what happens when we try to get God to bless someone that we're not. God cannot bless who we pretend to be. Oh, we can convince everybody else. We can get the PR campaign going. We can get them to believe a lot of things about us. But Jacob was a pretender. Jacob was not Esau. Jacob knew how to scheme. He knew how to scam. He'd become very skilled at conniving and convincing. If he wanted something, he knew how to get it. If he wanted it, he knew what he needed to do, and that's what he did. And when he got it, he becomes a fugitive. He's hiding. Is he enjoying that blessing? When it came to getting the blessing, Isaac got it. But it came with unexpected baggage. I really feel like I'm in my office counseling with somebody right now. I fought for it. I lied about it. I connived to get it. I pretended and then I got it and it came with this extra baggage and it's not what I thought it was. It's not making me feel good. It's not making me happy you ain't happy now, you won't be happy then. Happiness ain't out there, it's in here. And while he got that blessing that he lied for, I'm convinced it did not satisfy him the way he thought it was going to. He felt empty, he felt unfulfilled, and even a hundred years later, when Solomon writes in Proverbs chapter 10, verse 22, that the blessing of the Lord makes a person rich, and he, the Lord, adds no sorrow with it. The blessing of the Lord does not bring sorrow into our lives, but that's where Jacob's at. He thought he got a blessing, but what he got was sorrow. In other words, when God gives us something, he gives us the ability to enjoy it, not to be on the run, not to be a fugitive, not to be hiding. And if you don't hear anything else, you need to hear this. The blessing that Jacob received was limited Because he dressed and acted like Esau. I I could be wrong here. I've been wrong before. Well, I was wrong once before. And then I found out later I was actually right. And so I'm going to say, I'm going to go out on a limb here. and, And the men don't have to confirm this. 
I think one of the greatest challenges that we've had in our men's meeting that has brought about the greatest change in the lives of some of our men is for us just to be honest about ourselves, where we're at, what our weaknesses are, just to look in the mirror and be honest. And that's exactly what God wants us to do. That's exactly what he wants us to do. We cannot live as though we're someone else. We cannot live as though we want who we want to be. And if we're honest, if we're honest, it's easy to relate to Jacob's story. Because so many of us have followed after it. And then we wonder why we feel so empty, why we're so disappointed once we receive whatever that was. Now, I'm not sure if you can relate to this, but let me just metaphorically paint three versions of me to see, how, see which one that you might fit in or see if you can relate to all three of them. First, there's the me that I currently am. It's me, right? I confess that there's a lot of upside to this version, but there's also a lot of weaknesses in this version. There's some wrinkles, there's some warts, and I call this version of me troublesome Terry. Very troublesome. But then there's this other version of me that I wished I could be. You know that part of me that's a, a problem because I know it's, it's the me that I'll never become. The perfect husband, perfect father, perfect grandfather, perfect pastor. Now, I call this version of me terrific, Terry. So in my desperate attempt to bridge the gap, remember what we remember? My third word, God's third word, and the tension in between. In my desperate attempt to bridge the gap between troublesome Terry and terrific Terry, I create another version of myself. I call this guy temporary Terry. Maybe I can be terrific if I fake it. Maybe I can convince everybody that I am all that and a bag of chips. Maybe I can pretend, I can pose, I can act like I'm someone I'm not because I think the real me is not good enough. I, I need to let that sink in because the simple fact is temporary Terry doesn't really exist. That one in the middle, trying to build the bridge, doesn't really exist. But I spent so much time trying to convince people that he does, that I don't want to give it up. I want to continue to be temporary Terry. But deep inside, I suspect people are beginning to see through it. Now remember, I may not be talking about myself. I may be. But I also may be talking about some of y'all. You just keep pretending. You just keep putting up the pretense because the real me is just too frustrating. The real me is somebody that maybe no one would understand. The real me is something that I don't really like. And maybe you identify with one of these versions or maybe all three of them. Maybe it's better said that we do whatever is necessary, whatever is necessary to make it look like we have our lives all together. We call that our Facebook family, don't we? We put our best pictures on there so that everybody thinks that we got it all together. That there's no way anybody would believe that there's trouble at paradise here. We've got it all together. And then we got people that look at that and say, man, if we could just be like. And all of a sudden they start pretending too. Now, I think we should be positive people. I think we should be people of faith. I think we should live our lives according to the word of God. But I don't think we should whitewash our weaknesses. I don't think we should whitewash our insecurity. I don't think we should spend as much energy faking it as we could changing it. So here's a suggestion to you. How about we cut ourselves some slack? How about we cut ourselves some slack? Because God's not in love with the future you. God's in love with the real you. Not the future you that you think someday, some way I'll become. No, he's in love with you right now. Even the frustrating parts. You don't have to raise your hand. You can if you want to. But I wonder who else in the, in the house or watching my Facebook, you got frustrating parts about you that you, you know that God's not happy with. And you know you need to change it. 
Because the simple fact is God cannot bless temporary Terry, the guy that I have pretended to be. He can't even bless terrific Terry. You know why? Because terrific Terry doesn't exist. Isn't that crazy? We try to become someone we're not expecting God to bless that person when that person's not even real. But he can bless troublesome Terry. He can bless troublesome Terry because that's the beta version of me. That's who he made me to be. He can bless that as long as I can come to grips with it. He can love me, and in that love, he can transform me into what he wants me to be, far beyond my own expectations, but not as long as I'm pretending to be somebody else. For that to happen, for God to bless me beyond my expectations, I have to come to grips with the real me, and so do you. So do we. We must embrace who we are. Listen, embrace who we are before we can become what we were meant to be. Because if you don't embrace who you are and you continue to pile things on, you're just pile things on to a person that is not you. Kind of what's going on with Jacob. But it's also what's happening in our world today. Listen to me, young ladies taking those Snapchat pictures just to get the attention of the boys instead of just being you only to find that you're going to be betrayed by those guys anyway. I know what you're saying. Oh, Pastor Terry, everybody's doing it. Well, if everybody's doing it, then that boy can find somebody else. Right? Good young men playing the part of... An, if, if this offends you when I use these words, I'm not sorry. <laughs> Young men playing the part of thugs and punks, thinking that somehow, some way, that's going to get the world to recognize them. And then all of a sudden, their true compassion gets short-circuited. Listen to me, young men. Real young men love Jesus. And they want to encourage other people to love Jesus. Mothers and wives trying to be Martha Stewart and Beyonce. Now listen, God blessed me with one of those, but <laughs> normally it doesn't happen that way. She's not even here, and I said that about her. You want to be a good mother, you want to be a good spouse, but you live under that constant cloud that you've got to measure up to this or that or Beyonce. What about husbands who decide to work 14 hours and max out your credit cards which only brings anxiety and stress instead of the provision that you thought it was going to bring. Remember the blessing that you got that you thought was going to make you fulfilled, and then it doesn't. And then you find yourself as a fugitive. <laughs> if your credit cards are maxed and you don't pay them, you might end up a fugitive. I don't know. That's not my call. But listen, you end up with those disorders because they're self-imposed. Not because that's what God wants. None of this was ever God's intent. None of it. Not with Jacob, not with us. As a matter of fact, the kind of stress and pressure doesn't come from the blessings that we pretend to get on the pretend person that we are because God gives every good and perfect gift. Every good and perfect gift. Not the ones that we try to get because we are pretending to be somebody that we're not. Listen. God loves the real you and the real me. He loves us right now as much as he ever has or ever will, and there's nothing you can do about it. So what is the point of pretending? What's the point of pretending to be something that you're not when God loves who you are right now as much as he ever has or ever will? And his blessing is found in our honesty his blessing is found in our transparency, not in who we're pretending to be. See, Jacob thought pretending to be Esau was the answer to his emptiness. I wished I would have been born first. I wish I'd have got the blessing. I wish I'd have got double portion of the inheritance. And he thought if he could somehow pretend to be Esau and get those things, that that would get rid of the emptiness. And instead, it put him on the run. Instead, the pretense that he created caused him to become a fugitive and sent him into exile. 
I hope that you can connect the dots right here because there's a lot of Christians that have sent themselves into exile thinking that if I could just have this, I'll be happy. And then you get it, it's not fulfilling, and the next thing you know, you're sitting in church and you, don't, you can't even listen. Oh, boy. And so he spends the next 21 years running. And most of that time he spent with Uncle Laban. Now listen, as bad as Jacob was, Uncle Laban was 10 times worse. We don't have time to talk about Uncle Laban, but he was a bad dude. I'll just put it that way. He, you can read about it if you want to. He was a bigger trickster than Jacob was. Remember, you reap what you sow. So eventually Jacob decides to return home. Eventually Jacob decides, I'm going to face the past. Whatever consequence that brings, I'm ready for it. I'm going home. And along the way, when he decides that he's going to be real and he's going to encounter the past and he's going to seek forgiveness from Esau, on the way home, guess what happened? He encountered God, the real God, not the pretend God, not the fake God. And because he had an encounter with God, guess what happened? He had an encounter with himself, the real him. Isn't it funny how that happens? You can read the story, Genesis 32. Let me just paraphrase it for you real quick. After two decades, 21 years of exile, Jacob is on his way to make peace. Look at me. He was terrified. He knew that Esau was not going to be happy. Jacob created a vain imagination. Man, we do that. We create realities that don't exist. Jacob had made his mind up. My brother's going to kill me. He made his mind up. That's the way it was going to be. As a matter of fact, the night before he was supposed to meet his brother, he sent his family on because he was afraid his brother was going to kill his family. We do that. We create these realities that are not even real. You know my story. I used to live on 152 out in Lavalette, and the front yard was like this, and so I mowed like this like that. Anybody that lives in Wayne County, you know what that's. You mow with the mower up here. And I, I, in my mind, I knew that as I went across, what if a rock kicked out from my lawnmower, hit a car on 152 and caused that car to go into a house and people died. And by the time I turned around and came back, I had myself in court with a specialist that knew the angles of rocks and how it never even happened. We do it. That's what Jacob's doing right here. He's just creating this reality. Sent his family on, and he ends up wrestling with God. Some think it was Jesus pre-incarnate. Whether it was God, Jesus, or maybe just a strong angel, it was somebody that came from the Lord, and he wrestled with him all night. This opponent, God, Jesus, an angel, would not, let, would not stop wrestling. Jacob just held on to him. This guy dislocated Jacob's hip. Jacob didn't give up. He may not have known who he was wrestling, but he knew that he had a hold of something of significance. Better yet, something of significance had a hold of him. The man who had spent his whole life grabbing is now being grabbed. And in the heat of the battle, Here's what Jacob declares, Genesis 32, 26. He said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Everybody got the picture? Jacob's on his way to try to make good, extend the olive branch with Esau, who he's been running from for 21 years. He knows it's going to be a bad scene. He's on his way the night before he begins wrestling with an angel or God or pre-incarnate Jesus. They wrestle all night long. Evidently, this being tries to get away from him. Jacob won't let go. The being takes, hits him in the hip, dislocates his hip, still won't let go of him. And Jacob says, I will not let you go until you bless me. Isn't that interesting? 97 years old at this point. 97 years old and had not weakened his resolve. He was still looking for blessing. He was still looking for something. The same tenacity that he had in the womb when he wrestled with his brother, the same tenacity he had when he outside the womb is the same tenacity that he's wrestling with now. 
And seemingly, out of nowhere, Jacob's had a hold of this God, Jesus, an angel, had a hold of him all night long. And suddenly, the man, the angel, God, Jesus, asked this question in verse 27. What is your name? I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. Well, what's your name? Now, that may seem like a random question, but you might remember Jacob's been asked this question before. And before when he was asked that question, he said, I'm Esau, didn't he? And now he's being asked, what's your name? And he's thinking, listen, we've been wrestling all night. You broke my hip and now you want to get acquainted? What's this all about? That's not the question he was asking. What's your name? What's your name? Who are you? And finally, when Jacob gets honest with himself, we hear him say, I am Jacob. That is my third word. I'm a deceiver. I'm a backstabber. I'm a heel grabber. I was the second born. I'm the pretender. I'm the broken. I'm Jacob. He finally realizes who he is. How freeing that is when you don't have to pretend anymore. When you don't have to spend the resources and the energy to try to be something that you're not. It's not about the car we drive. It's not about the house that we live in. Jacob finally recognizes who he is with all of his imperfections and all of his insufficiencies because he's holding on to God now (laughs) and he's holding on to God with dear life and because he gets real with himself and he understands who he is with all of his wrinkles and all of his warts God says to him in verse 28 your name will no longer (laughs) be Jacob but now it's going to be Israel now it's going to be Israel which means triumphant with God think about that He's gone from being Jacob, the heel grabber, supplanter, usurper, to now he's Israel, one who is triumphant with God. I mean, I don't know about you, but that's quite an upgrade. That's a whole lot better. Jacob was still Jacob, but in God's eyes, he was Israel. His weaknesses, his troubles, all the things about him suddenly became real to him, but yet in his weakness, God became strong. Because when I am weak, he is strong. I mean, that's the paradox of the third word. That place where I think I'm this and God says I'm that, and somehow I've got to bridge that. Somehow I've got to get from that to that. But most of the time, I spend my life living in between. And the tension that that brings into my life. I just wonder when we're going to embrace who God says we are instead of who we say we are or instead of who the world says that we are. Linda, if you'll come. Your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel. And then it says in verse 29, then... He blessed him there. When when was then? When he owned his third word. When he said, I am Jacob. This is who I am. Take me this way. If we could ever learn to do it. In our lives individually, in marriage, in family, on our jobs, in our schools. Just be who God made you to be. And I just wonder who's wrestling this morning. Who's wrestling right now with your insecurities, with your fears? And because of that, it's caused you to pretend to be something that you're not. Jacob was preparing to meet Esau. He thought he was going to kill him. Instead, he meets God and he changes his name. Anytime you have an encounter with God, it's going to change something. Might change your walk, might change your name, but it's going to change something. 
And what God did is he brought him to a place to where Jacob could make peace with himself. And he didn't have to worry about everybody else. Here's the end of the story before we pray. Jacob knew Esau was going to be mad, so Jacob planned to give Esau a bunch of gifts. We do that, don't we? Don't be mad at me. Here's $100. And he was going to bring him to Esau to try to get Esau to be easy with him, to take it easy and not kill everybody. But none of that really turned out to be necessary because we read in chapter 33, verse 4, that Esau ran to meet Jacob and embraced him and threw his arms around him and kissed him and wept and wept. Look at what changed for Jacob once he owned his third word, once he realized who he was. And I just wonder who this morning, sitting right here in the sanctuary watching us on Facebook, you need Jesus to throw his arms around you. kiss you on the cheek and let you know that he loves you because the only real battle that we need to win is that battle that's within time to quit blaming mommy and daddy quit blaming society and culture own it this is who I am God take me use me mold me fill me spirit of the living God fall fresh on me stand with me Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the stories that we can read that relate so much to our lives today. And I pray that as we've reached this point of the service, that people have reached a point of decision. And I pray that as they've reached that point of decision, that you would give them the boldness and the courage to act on the decision. Help us this morning, I pray in Christ's name. Keep your heads bowed for just a moment. If you're here this morning, you're not in a right relationship with Jesus Christ. Maybe you were at one time, fell away from that. Maybe you've never made a commitment to him. I would say to you, Jesus is ready to throw his arms around you. He wants to change your name to child. But he also gave you the choice that you can decide to do that. You're a free, volitional being. You have a will of your own to do what you want to do. So as the praise team sings... If that's you this morning and we can pray together, would you come? Would you do it right now? Look at me for just a moment. We're going to be dismissed. But if you're a believer this morning, it is time for the real you to meet the real God so that we can become all the things that he wants us to be. You know why? Because he needs us. He needs us. We are his hands and feet on this planet. And he needs the real us to meet the real him so that he can bless us and throw his arms around us and kiss us on the cheek and tell us that he loves us. I don't know what that does for you, but that makes me feel good. It makes me feel good. I love you. I hope you know that. We, we, I think we're going to finish this up next week, maybe. I'm, I'm not putting a period there. I'm putting a question mark there. But uh, regardless, I hope that it's uh, been able to minister to you, that God qualifies us. He blesses us, but he can only do that when we know who the real us is. 
And so I pray you have a great day. Don't forget tonight at 6 o'clock. Help me with the chairs, if you will. Three high, no more than three. If you do four, I'm going to punch you. God bless you. We'll see you next time.